One of the big conversations that you have all asked us to investigate is these pesky lines you keep seeing up in the sky. Now, there's a lot of conversations about this, and I've told you before, I'm a skeptic on all sides. I'm a skeptic on all sides of every conversation until someone can prove to me otherwise. I need evidence. I need facts. So there's a lot that we know. There's a lot that's reported on. But is that the entire story? That's what we're going to get into today. Is this the only thing we should be worried about when it comes to chemtrails? Water officials in the Inland Empire want to make it rain. In China, they're waging war on the weather. A drought so severe, they're firing rockets into the sky to make it rain. Lasers now could one day manipulate rain and lightning. They're using science and the process called cloud seeding to increase the amount of rain in some areas. We physicists are firing trillion watt lasers into the sky to actually precipitate rain clouds and actually bring down lightning bolts. This is potentially a game changer. Pilots target clouds full of moisture and eject small amounts of an inert chemical. Then, the water in the cloud condenses around the new particles and gets heavy, falling to the ground as precipitation. Drones and rockets are used to sow silver iodide into the clouds. The substance has a similar structure to ice and changes the cloud's structure to increase the chance of rain. When we have a good you know, chance for, uh, for a cloud, we send the aircraft to that location. It go under the cloud start to release all the salt will go inside the cloud. Uh, the droplets will become bigger and start to uh, rain. So does cloud seeding cause flooding? Is it responsible for damaging rain? Is silver iodide a harm to our health or environment? The science and the experts say no. Since the 1940s, people have been seeding clouds and watching the effects with their own eyes. Since the 1946 experiments of Dr. Vincent Schaefer, we have known that some clouds can be modified through seeding to yield additional precipitation. We're not really playing God. I think that's really overstating uh, what we're doing. Human activity affects the weather all of the time. We're being very specific and targeted, and environmentally friendly. Well, it's my honor and pleasure to be joined right now by weather modification expert, Jim Lee. Uh, Jim, we here on the high wire, we've been doing, you know, an investigation, really starting to look at chemtrails, contrails, whatever you want to call it. And in, in part of that investigation, a lot of people reached out to us and said, you got to check out what Jim Lee is saying about uh, these issues. And so just to start off, you know, when people look up in the sky and they see these checkerboards that are, you know, going across the sky and then they start turning these clouds, a lot of people will say that didn't used to be that way. That is a clear sign that those are chemtrails, that they're spraying toxic poisons in the sky. Is that what these are in your mind? Well, this is probably the most common question that I get. And I had, to, I ended up doing probably a two hour video on my YouTube channel at Climate Viewer on YouTube called I Remember Blue Skies. In my personal opinion, there always has been a cloud problem. And this is based on newspaper articles that we've gathered 850 newspaper articles back to the 1850s. And the earliest documentation we have on, you know, planes making clouds cover blocking out the sun is 1948 and in 1958 palm springs california actually got into it with the air force because they said basically their entire um, tourism industry is predicated on having sunshine filled skies yet our skies look like a mob of exuberant sky riders blocking out the sun hmm. And a month later, the U.S. Air Force had a meeting with the, the city officials of Palm Springs in 1959, January. And they basically explained to them, there are skyways or highways in the sky. And you are at the intersection of all air, you know, air traffic on the West Coast. So either, as they put it, live with the vapor trails or move the city of Palm Springs. Mm. In 1970... The state of Illinois and New Jersey sued the airline industry for blocking out the sun. Um, Secretary of Transportation James A. Volpe actually stepped in to mediate 
the lawsuit and try to settle it out of court. And the airline industry does, agreed to install new burner cans or fuel injectors to reduce particulate emissions over the state of Illinois, New Jersey, promising this would reduce what they called at that time smoke pollution of the sky. So the word chemtrail comes about circa 1997. That was the first time it was used on the internet. The very first article about chemtrails was specifically about JP-8 jet fuel and how it markedly increased the amount of clouds in the sky. And this is due to the conversion that all NATO countries converted from gasoline to kerosene in what they called one fuel for the battlefield or the single fuel concept. This dramatically increased the amount of metal nanoparticles in the atmosphere. So that's why, in my personal opinion, though there have been longstanding complaints, there is a marked increase from 1996 to present in the number of visible trails that hang out everywhere. And you, you got to split this 50-50. On the one hand, we have a long history of the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, creating clouds from scratch with something called carbon black dust. On the other hand, we have commercial aviation, which uses, you know, that pollutes the sky, and that is black carbon or soot. Carbon black is manufactured. Soot is what you get when you go on a Boy Scout camp out and you burn wood. Soot is a cloud condensation nuclei, so is carbon black dust. So there's this semantic problem that we have, and the most common argument is this. Contrails disappear. Chemtrails stick around. The problem is, this is an argument based on slave speak. Slave speak is language that maintains a master-slave relationship. It is the use of high-level descriptors, which are highly argumentative, have different meanings to different individuals based on their individual perceptions. So what I try to do, I try to use the lowest common, you know, level of language. Because whereas you and I might, you know, if I say orange or apple, basketball, you know what I mean, I know what I mean. We don't have to have a lengthy discussion about it. But when you say words like good, evil, God, government, vaccine, right. <laughs> um, they, have, they have many different meanings to di different individuals, and it's based on their own personal perceptions. So chemical trail, con trail, chemical trail, it's a trail of chemicals. Contrail. They'll say it's just water vapor. It's condensating. Um, it's condensation. The problem with that argument is, and, and you try this at home, ask that chem troll condensating on what? Because water doesn't just condensate on itself. It has to have a seed. That's how clouds are made. So whether it's intentional or unintentional, whether it's accidental or it's covert, you still need some form of chemical. You need three things to make a cloud. You need a seed, you need water vapor, and you need some kind of ionizing radiation or static. So without that seed, there's nothing for it to con condensate on. Without the water vapor, there's nothing to freeze. And without that static electricity or what's normally galactic cosmic rays, you don't have the three in, you know, ingredients to make a cloud. So persistence happens um, in some cases naturally, which has happened since World War II. They've had the Appleman chart. One of my good friends is a meteorologist was in the U.S. Navy, and he would go out and throw radio signs and you, based on the Appleman chart, tell a guy, yo, Maverick, before you fly the F-14 Tomcat back to the aircraft carrier, you might want to avoid this region, which is called an ice supersaturated region, because if you fly through that, you're going to make long-lasting persistent contrails, which are going to lead the enemy right back to our position. Mm. 
this is something that most people don't consider. Um, if you're in the military and you've got an F-117 stealth bomber, do you think they want white lines pointing at it when they're flying over Iraq? They don't. So in military systems, they actually have contrail suppression systems. To, to, it's basically antifreeze for wow. the exhaust pipe. Alternatively, and, and this is where everybody wants to get into the rub with this. They're like, every single plane on the planet is geoengineering. Every tic-tac-toe I see is geoengineering. Right. And I, I say, for that to be true, you need to back it up with observational data. You don't need to just say, and Edgar Allan Poe said this pretty famously, believe none of what you hear and only half that you see. I live by that mantra. So I understand that my perceptions can skew what I view. That's why, you know, the name of my website is Climate Viewer. Um, I want to look at things from a macro perspective. And when I look at the macro of this, you have David Keith funded by Bill Gates. And Bill Gates says, yo, David, how much would it cost to do this geoengineering, solar geoengineering, stratospheric aerosol injection thing you're talking about? And around 2010, he got with Aurora Flight Sciences. They came up with a bunch of estimates and they estimated between 100 to as few as 14 747 jets. So if it only takes 14 planes to geoengineer the entire planet, what are the other 130,000 flights per day doing? Mm -hmm. That's where I want to, you know, where I'm at, I, I deal, I'm a, I'm a, you know, pathological skeptic, if you will. I know that people Ditto. watch this show, think that, you know, I, I know I get accused of being a conspiracy theorist, but the truth is, is I'm skeptical on all sides of a, of a conversation until I see enough science to see, you know, to decide otherwise. In this conversation, I'm still searching for a lot of evidence. And, you know, you're making a point that I'm, I always think, which is, look, you know, I know I've, I've, I know that we have studied weather modification. I know that it's been used before, even as far back as, as Vietnam. Uh, my question is, are all these lines I'm seeing in the days that I see them a part of some giant program across our nation and I guess the world where there's little sprayers? Here's the question. There's little sprayers that I've seen in some of these videos that are releasing, you know, cloud seeding, whatever it is, trying to block the sun, all the different reasoning. To me, that would just be so incredibly expensive. And it looks to me like the same patterns I would imagine that commercial airlines lines are making. And then I think about the photos I've seen of these, you know, airplanes with these giant tanks of liquid inside of them. And I think I don't see any room for luggage in there. These are what are called ballast tanks. Um, ballast tanks, generally speaking, almost exclusively are for testing flights before they're commissioned for public use. So in those tanks, and you'll see the pipes running along the ground, yep. there's a lot of water. And the purpose of this, the famous one, Trump, um, Trump travels through, you know, chemtrail plane. And that was actually the Boeing 737 Dreamliner um, before it, you know, became public. In that plane, they had the ballast tanks. And it's to simulate, for lack of a better word, a large person rapidly moving around the cockpit um it's to simulate luggage or heavy you know anything in the cargo bay rapidly moving around to try to throw the plane off balance mm. so there's a rugged set of tests that have to be done to each plane and these are the most common misused images for the chemtrail community um again ballast tanks Pipes in between, all run. You see the passenger seats at the front. It, the purpose of this is literally to try to throw the plane off balance. Um, and anybody can go look these photos up. And I have never been sent a photo that I've not been able to track down. In fact, some of them even have like patent numbers right on the bottle. And it's like, dude, you didn't even read the number and look it up. Here's the patent for flight testing. Um, that, that's not to say that there aren't aerial specifically designed aerial spraying platforms. 
Youngstown Air Force Base is a good example where the C-130s have um, oil dispersant and what's called adulticide sprayers. Um, everybody always um, cites Evergreen Aviation, specialty corporations that are designed to either do firefighting, oil dispersant, or adulticide deforestation. Adulticide, for those who don't know, is mosquito spraying. Okay. Um, so, for example, after Katrina, Youngstown Air Force Base had their C-130s out spraying chemicals to kill mosquitoes. Now, is that good for you and me? I don't think so. But at the same time, they believe that they call this disease vector control. So often those images are misappropriated. They're like, look, here's a, the United States military with their spray tanks. But C-130s aren't going to be doing geoengineering, which kind of brings us full circle to the semantics of all of this. What is geoengineering by definition? Great. Let me just Ge lock it down for Go someone because we've done a lot of talking here. So what you're saying is you don't believe when I'm seeing these lines in the sky that dissipate, that that's a sprayer releasing something. You're saying that in your research that that's jet fuel. That's what jet fuel does. You know, the exhaust of jet fuel, the soot, is what is creating that collects like particles in the sky that are collecting the water, which then freeze, and then that turns into this serious clouds. You're saying that the the reference to these go all nine, the way back. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying 98%. I always leave room for everybody's favorite, you know, punching bag, the CIA, because the CIA was involved in Operation Popeye, weather warfare with Vietnam. The CIA did Operation Nile Blue to deny rainfall to Cuba to kill Castro sugar crops. The CIA in front of the CFR said geoengineering is a good idea. The United States government has deemed climate change a national security concern. So if you see white unmarked planes spraying, you know, God knows what up there to geo for the specific purpose of geoengineering, I'm pointing the finger first at the CIA, then at private corporations. I'm, I'm going to make that yeah. honest, very clear. However, every single chemical that has ever been attributed to chemtrails that everybody's ever complained about can be found in jet fuel and its additives. I have, I, I, think I, I think you have, we have, you sent us this uh, graphic of the periodic table basically showing all these chemicals that are known to be in jet fuel. This is metals detected in jet exhaust. And this leads to a quite This is the question. I'm really glad you provided this because this is the question I've been asking. You know, aluminum and barium and all these things that they say, you know, is what is falling down from the sky. We see it on our plants. We see it, you know, there's tests have been done. I've been asking, but I mean, the, the exhaust, like this is jet fuel. It's got a lot of this stuff in it already right right it's kerosene so it the, the the less refined a hydrocarbon based fuel is the more um natural metals will be in it a great example of this is ship tracks now ship tracks are international shipping and up until 2020 when the international Mar maritime organization banned bunker fuel they were running on what's called heavy fuel oil and heavy fuel oil is the bottom of the barrel of the, you know, the cycle of producing gasoline. As you climb that ladder and you get up to kerosene, which is a paraffin, up to gasoline and even, you know, higher um, cleanliness, let's just put it that way, you, you refine out a lot of these natural made metals. But for Jet A, which is the predominant jet fuel in America, Jet A1 is the predominant fuel in the rest of the world. Every single one of the chemicals that everybody's finding in their rainfall samples has been admitted to by peer-reviewed journal studies, single particle mass spectrometry, directly behind an engine on a runway. Soot is covered in graphene. Okay, we'll start there. Because this is the biggest, one of the biggest topics is graphene lately. Yep. Soot is laminated in graphene. 
and it has sulfuric acid around it because SO2 becomes H2SO4, that's, hydro, that's sulfuric acid inside of the soot particle, the black carbon, is all of the metals that are on that periodic table. Soot is the cloud condensation nuclei that the water condenses on. So whenever you're, when we're, we're talking about the buildup of atmospheric aerosols from fake clouds, I like to call them artificial clouds or plain farts because Good. I'm so annoyed, I get so annoyed by this chemtrail versus contrail versus geoengineering versus nanobots, Morgellons, all the other crazy stuff that I hear. Um, at the end of the day, they're artificial clouds. That's, that's the takeaway from this. Whether it's a chemtrail or a contrail, once it fans out and it covers the sky, it is neither. It is a cirrus cloud. That goes back to what geoengineering is. The idea of geoengineering originated the term 1977 by Cesare Machetti. He specifically was talking about CO2 sequestration. 1991, Mount Pinatubo erupts. 1994, Lawrence Livermore National Labs gets involved. And they say, what if we were to you know, spray sulfur into the stratosphere to mimic what Mount Pinatubo did? Uh-huh. That's the origination of the modern solar geoengineering or stratospheric aerosol injection ideology. Which is what we hear when we hear Bill Gates on all of these things. And so, you know, to be clear then, what you're saying is these are chemicals. They are in the sky. They are not good for us. The question, you know, is, is whether it's being delivered by a sprayer or it's in the jet fuel. I think even more simply put, is it on purpose or is it on accident? Is it just a part of, you know, airline travel in most circumstances? I think you and I would both agree there's definitely studies that are being done. I would have to imagine our military, our CIA, has not given up on the idea of being able to start a hurricane and wipe somebody out or create a drought. I have to imagine all of that type of investigation is still going on because in my mind, anything that would be a great weapon, our government is not going to be the last ones developing it. We're going to be the best at it. But, you know, does that mean that we're, what we're seeing is a purposeful trail being left to either dumb us down or poison us or block the sun? And what you're saying, these things are, you know, I think we could, could I say this? Those chemicals are not good for you. They could potentially be dumbing you down, affecting your brain, affecting your breathing. They are. Uh, can be blocking the sun, can be having all of these sorts of issues. You're not saying that that's not happening. What you're saying is it is an accidental byproduct of modern jet fuel and aviation for the most part. Except... Okay. And I've been waiting. To, I've been waiting for this curveball. Now that we've got to this point, yeah. In nineteen, um, in in two thousand one, we'll start there. Um, when nine eleven happened, they grounded all flights for three days, and a couple guys at Langley Research Center basically studied the fact that hey, here's a rare opportunity. We don't have planes making clouds all day long. What changes in the atmosphere are going to occur? And what they found was the diurnal temperature range great, greatly widened. What that means, if it normally during the day, you have a 70 degree day and a 50 degree night, instead during this cloudless sky, we had a 70 degree day and a thir you know 40 degree night. So about a 10 degree difference in the nighttime. So that led them to believe that in fact, the clouds that are being created aren't cooling the planet. They're actually net warming the planet because they're creating a blanket over the sky. So this was kind of a turning point because there were all these assumptions made up to this point that, hey, this is good for, you know, stopping global warming, global boiling, you know, the whole CO2 scheme. Yeah, let's block the sun um, and we do ourselves a favor. Got it, yep. But in reality, it only works during the daytime, which led me down a new rabbit hole to prove the single word, the, if, to, to, to sum up your question in a single word, 
the entire chemtrail conspiracy boils down to intent. So uh, I wanted to prove intent with commercial aviation. I already know intent with G with the military. I already know that, you know, the military, um, Dr. Arnold A. Barnes from U.S. Air Force Phillips Lab, I have FOIAs, I have all of this on the weather modification history timeline on climateviewer.com, um, that they can create and suppress contrail cirrus on demand using carbon black, and the purpose for doing so, they claim, is to block spy satellite optics and improve nighttime operations. So the idea that they could block out Chinese spy satellites by creating clouds, or like in the Iraqi, you know, desert storm, um, when the Iraqi Republican Guard just got their, you know, butts handed to them and came out with their hands up and everybody was so confused. Well, when you block out the moon at night and we have night vision, it's kind of a one-sided fight. Right. So that's why the military say they do it. But back to why the commercial aviation, the 130 to 150,000 flights per day, the 15 million barrels of jet fuel per day just in the United States that are burned. I wanted to find that smoking gun, that memo, that intent. And it came to me in 2010 at an ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, Colloquium on Climate Change from the world's leading expert on contrail physics, Ulrich Schumann. He's from Germany's DLR, they're NASA. At the end of his little thesis, he said, we want less warming, more cooling contrails, predictable for operational planning. That was a smoking gun for me, and that really opened my eyes to what the nefarious agenda behind all this was. I started to see intent, but I needed more evidence to prove intent. The EPA basically, um, Obama administration was trying to regulate greenhouse gases coming out of airplane emissions, and they're using the Clean Air Act. I'm, that's, I'm not going to stand for this. So I, I called them, I wrote in to them, and I said, no, you guys asked if the, there was going to be any public hearing. I want a public hearing. And they called me back and said, you're the only person who's responded. We, we, you know, you don't have to come here. Um, you could just write us a letter. And I was like, no, I have the recording of the actual phone call. It's absolutely hilarious. I said, no, I think I'd rather a public hearing. Um, and after which, you know, basically the international civil aviation organization, the pilots administration, friends of the earth, um, all of these NGOs had to show up. So I figured I'd bring five of my friends. And I brought four people from the chemtrail community who don't think exactly like me. Cause I, you know, the, I, my favorite saying is the day we all agree is the day we could all be wrong. Right. So I wanted to bring five different perspectives, mine plus four other people. And we went up to Washington DC and gave them what for. The stated purpose of this hearing is to consider the full range of pollution generated by aircraft. You, the EPA, claim the authority to regulate aviation emissions under the Clean Air Act, a law that should protect us from the aforementioned poisonous pollution. There is evidence to show that persistent contrails do in fact warm the earth. Contrails do change the climate. Pollutants from aircraft that need prohibition is causing serious negative health impacts to many forms of life. The EPA and Obama administration are ignoring the global outrage over the most visible climate change concern from airplanes cloud creation. You must do more than pass the buck back and forth between other three letter agencies. We are counting on you as the protectors of the environment to act. The Obama administration, while everybody was having the Trump Hillary Clinton election, you know, wall to wall coverage, everything always happens while nobody's looking right. The Obama administration signed the Federal Alternative Aviation Fuel Emissions Pact with the European Union, China, and the ICAO. This can be summed up in just a couple words, biofuels for contrail control, which goes back to what Ulrich Schumann was saying. To change the chemical constituents coming out of jet aircraft so that there's less warming, more cooling contrails. So I got in touch with the guy at the FAA who was testing the biofuels. 
His name is Dr. Rangasai Halthori. He is the head of the FAA's Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative. And I specifically asked him, and I, I sent him the documentation. I said, what did Ulrich Schumann mean by less warming, more cooling contrails? Predictable for operational planning. He says, and I, he, play, he plays it off, but at the end of the day, he says, we want more contrail-induced cirrus clouds by day and none by night. Wow. This is, this is intent. I have this signed in writing um, directly from the head of the FAA's ACCRI. So now I have these two dots that I've got here pointed together, plus the biofuels thing. Now you look and you see American Airlines um, um, pairing up with Google Artificial Intelligence to route planes around contrail forming spaces in the sky. These are called ice supersaturated regions. Basically, Google AI and goes back to what Ulrich Schumann had actually created in 2010. He, produ he produced something called COSIP, the Contrail Cirrus Prediction Tool. COSIP has, has evolved to be part of what's called the next-gen transportation system in America. That's what makes all the tic-tac-toes in the sky. Um, it is a supercomputer that routes all the flights, and inside that supercomputer is a subsystem called the Aviation Environment Design Tool, AEDT. In the AEDT, it tells planes at what altitude to fly, how much fuel to burn, all of these things. And it takes in environmental concerns into how it routes flights. So when you compare... And contra when you when you sum it up, you got Schumann less warming, more cooling contrails. Rangasai Halthori none clouds by day, none during the night. What did the Biden administration just can't come out with? A report on solar radiation modification. What three areas of study did they say they want to focus on? Stratospheric aerosol injection. They call it solar radiation modification. Um, marine cloud brightening, we can get into that if you want, I'm going to skip it, and cirrus cloud thinning. So what you have here is a grand conspiracy between the scientists who are trying to, as they would put it, mitigate global warming impacts from aviation. But in reality, what they're doing is they're turning what's been 60 to 80 years worth of pollution into an active geoengineering program. That is, all right, so let me, let me just, just for people, because this, this is super fascinating, because <clears throat> if there, I'm sure as you started, uh, we have a bunch of people watching saying, this guy's got to be working for the CIA. He's trying to convince me that there's no such thing as chemtrails and that this is all just a natural byproduct of, you know, jet fuel and that there's not geoengineering going on. But you have come full circle in you know, in, in saying no, here's what could be done and what you, you're, I think you're leaning to. Let me, let me just mirror it back. What you're saying is the natural function of jet fuel in the right circumstances, in these right pockets of humidity, that if it goes through, it will leave this trail, you know, collect the water, turn the ice particles, and turn these clouds. We know that we can fly in different spaces and go around these and not have trails uh, or not as many trails that would dissipate during the clouds. And so what they realize now, and I, and I know that there's now law, some states are looking at eliminating these contrails, and there's discussions on whether they cause global warming. But what you're saying is since all these particles do create these clouds, that there are officials that are now looking at running in a computer system that could easily say on a day of flight, we want to block 
block the sun during the day. So we're going to change the height or whatever that we're flying all the planes across that area in to create yes. contrails that are technically, if you want to call them chemtrails, they have chemicals in them, they're making this, but it's a natural byproduct. But where you're flying the planes decides whether you create them and whether you're blocking the sun. And then at night, they're going to fly on a different set of patterns to avoid putting out these clouds so that they don't hold and trap the, sun, the heat on the earth. And so all of this technically is a form of geoengineering, but all it's doing is rerouting planes to create it as the natural byproduct of the chemicals that are in their fuel. Did I explain that fairly clearly? You summed it up well. So I'm going to introduce a new term to you. Okay. This is called earth radiation management. Earth radiation management is the idea that the heat trapping effect of high altitude cirrus clouds, noctilucent clouds, nacreous clouds, that these clouds can trap heat at the air surfaces. So we have the troposphere and then the divider is the tropopause and above that is the stratosphere. Typically planes fly right near the tropopause. Okay. Okay. And what the Indian Space Organization found was that jet fuel emissions, the black carbon from jet fuel emissions, were found at 18 kilometers in the stratosphere. And the reason we know this is because black carbon from jet fuel burning is very unique because it's spherical. Carbon black is a cineform. It's actually shaped like grapes. So they know that this black carbon came from planes. And the Indian Space Organization was specifically looking into this because it was damaging um, the ozone layer and changing their monsoon season. So David Keith said he wanted to make what's called photophoretic engineered nanoparticles for geoengineering purposes. Photophoretic meaning self-levitating. So what we have is in this case is not only people trying to create clouds by day, none by night intentionally, we have the unintention, unintentional side effect, which has been going on the entire time, that the tropopause is not at the same altitude everywhere in the world. The closer you get to the North Pole, the lower it is, which means that if a flight is flying at 40,000 feet over South Carolina, it's under the tropopause, it's in the troposphere. If it's in Canada, it's likely already in the stratosphere. So all of its con you know, chemical constituents are being injected into the stratosphere. The Indian Space Organization found 10,000 black carbon particles per cubic centimeter. There have been so many metals found in the stratosphere at this point that the, the propaganda media are now trying to say space junk re-entering the atmosphere is the cause of the metals they're finding in the stratosphere, which is complete hogwash. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the spin room, you know, and the, the, and the issue just so management. people, because we've been doing some investigations into this. And one of the things that started bothering me about our investigation is if you were really trying to block out, you know, the sun, like Bill Gates wants to do, you wouldn't spend fortunes flying planes, you know, down in the troposphere right. because that fall, everything you're doing is going to fall to earth within about two weeks or so was, was what some of our investigations two, show. Two weeks to two months. All right, two and weeks to two months. But if you get it up in the stratosphere, in the stratosphere, it's just going to, you know, hang up there. And, so, and how long do you say if it's in the stratosphere? So two to four months in the troposphere, the same chemicals, if they were put in the stratosphere, their residence time would be two to four years. Wow. Meaning that if we stopped all flights today, that the geoengineering that has occurred as a result of nanoparticles of metal migrating into the stratosphere, it would be a minimum of two years before the sky is cleared. So I want to make this crystal clear to people. Geoengineering is sky whitening. Okay, it's the idea of making the sky whiter. When you look outside and you look straight up and you see a blue sky, and then you look at the horizon and you see a milky white horizon. 
That is whitening of the sky. So I'm going to take it a step further. Chuck Long from NOAA, Earth Systems Research Lab. That, that article you showed earlier, Accidental Geoengineering, that comes from Chuck Long because he did radiation budget studies all across America. He called this clear sky daylight brightening. He said that the sky was getting brighter because of a sub-visual ice haze generated by aircraft emissions in the stratosphere. So this doesn't classify as a cloud. This is the, the disconnect between everybody referring to just, you know, clouds that they see as geoengineering and the fact that the sky is continually getting whiter. It's getting whiter because reflective particles have been building up for decades now in the stratosphere. And every single day that we have another 130,000 flights, the concentration gets thicker. That's the And how the many million, problem. you said barrels or, or gallons, would you say, in, in America alone per day? Just, just in America per day, 15 million barrels of jet fuel per day. Before COVID struck, it was 19 million barrels per day. Um, and these are rough estimates that I've been able to gather. You know, they, they don't really make this kind of data public. Um, but, I, you know, globaleconomy.com has some direct information um, from the fuel people. So this is, this is a massive amount of fuel. And people will go, well, but Jim, but cars dwarf that, right? We're breathing way more nanoparticles. If we're sitting in rush hour traffic behind a bunch of catalytic converters, you're breathing way more than it hurts you way more. And I say to them, the, what makes this situation unique is that they're literally trying to change the radiation budget of the entire planet through intentional control of the clouds that are created and the buildup of aerosols in the stratosphere under a flawed ideology. Right there are the quotes. We would like to have more contrail-induced clouds during the day, none during the night. Yeah. Less warming, more cooling. This agenda is very clear. This, in my, in my opinion, proves intent beyond a shadow of a doubt. And you see it through the testing of biofuels. For those who aren't familiar with what biofuels are, mm -hmm. there's two main branches, Hafa and Fisher Trope. Trope, um, they do things like chicken fat grease to jet fuel. Um, Oil seed crops like the camelina plant or J-Trofa plant, they even spoke about using J-Trofa plant blended with nanoparticles of aluminum to increase um, the thrust of the engine. A landfill waste to jet fuel process. If you look up FT biofuels or Federal Alternative Aviation um, Biofuels, you're going to see some pretty crazy stuff. In fact, the world's first hydrogen, completely hydrogen-based plane um, did a test flight just a couple months ago. And they're doing all of this because at the end of the day, the airline industry is up against the climate cultists who will have their carbon taxes. Right. And air, the airline's carbon tax, if you include the heat trapping effect of nighttime Cirrus, would be tremendous because the cirrus effect dwarfs the co2 emissions of airplanes which i told the epa in 2015 nobody wanted to listen they're listening now and they're trying to turn this into a carbon offset or a carbon credit so they're basically the saying when we're creating chemtrails during the day we're bouncing the sun back so we should get some carbon credits for that because that's not heating the earth and if they can at night then release those clouds and let the heat escape now this this exhaust that they're spraying everywhere they can say it has a global benefit because we're actually using it in a way that benefits humanity which gets into this whole global warming insanity that we have around all this 
we could get really deep in the weeds on how intricate this all gets. Why did this become important to you? I mean, you know, I have kids. I, I mean, I, I think about the future. Why does sky whitening, which makes sense to me, you have two things. You have planes that are clearly coming, you know, close to this line of the stratosphere, sometimes dipping into it where the exhaust is staying up there. You also said these black particles, because of their shape, they're round, that when they get heated, they can lift up. So that can they get pulled up into the stratosphere if they were in the top of the, the uh, troposphere? Why does all of this matter when, you know, for us? What does it mean to humanity down here on Earth and, and what we're doing? Well, for me, you know, the birth of my daughter in 2009 was a, a kind of a game changer for me. So I I was already, you know, reading a lot of things that made me go, hmm. And suddenly I, I felt the need to, you know, try to do something better. I was a Boy Scout. I was taught to do a good turn daily. I figured, you know, I should, you know, do something about this because I care about, you know, our planet. I've always cared about our planet. I just never been motivated enough to do something about it. And when I got started and I, I started with geoengineering, I moved on to weather modification. Um, we cut it off at 1850 because we wanted to specifically start with the history of weather control and move forward. This is important to me because I want my daughter to be able to experience nature. And I've now had a second daughter. So one's 14, one's seven. I want them to grow up in a world where at, at least the sky has stars in it. And the projections today are that if this pattern continues, if population plus number of flights per day plus buildup of aerosols, there's a BBC article saying 20, by 2050, telescopes will be worthless. Wow. When I, when I read things like that, I go... I want my daughter to grow up to be able to see the stars. You know, her children should be able to see the stars. I do not want our planet to end up like Venus because a bunch of freaking technocrats are want to control global rainfall patterns and have their hand on the thermostat of the planet. So that that's the driving factor behind this. And to all those naysayers out there who are saying, but Jim, chemtrails, I'm going to say it to you like this. My modus operandi. In 1950 through 1970, the United States Air, um, Army Chemical Corps of Engineers were spraying zinc cadmium sulfide, radioactive particles, all over America. One of the biggest was um, Operation Large Area Coverage, where they literally flew a plane from one coast to the next, spraying radioactive material all across America. In downtown St. Louis, in poor black neighborhoods, they were spraying schoolhouses with radioactive particles. The, they followed these people until their death and then got their, exhumed their body, you know, got, got their thyroids to measure how much zinc cadmium sulfide was left in their body. And this was all to simulate nuclear warfare and how nuclear particles, you know, th this was during the fallout days. The reason I bring this up is because those chemtrails of the 1950s through 70s with what was called the Manhattan-Rochester Coalition, um, it was a, a Manhattan Project spinoff, they didn't admit to it till 2008. Yeah. So if you want to sit around and wait for the government, the CIA, or whoever to admit that they are currently using these unmarked planes for geoengineering purposes, I'm 47 years old now. I don't want to be 89 years old in a hospital bed, you know, on ZNN, and suddenly they're like, the government today admitted that in the 2020s, they were, <laughs> you know, doing an experiment to cool the earth. I don't want to wait that long. So if you'd like to wait that long, you go right ahead. I'm going to go ahead and operate on that which I can prove in a court of law. Yeah. Yeah. And right, and right now we're seeing that up in New Hampshire with the, the attempt to ban geoengineering. Um, I've been contacted by part the legal team up there. I've spoken with Rep Representative Jason Gerhardt and tried to help steer them in the right direction so that they can make some headway in a very terminology-driven world. So getting through this legalese and trying to, to make 
regular people understand this is a tough job. Let's get to the answer then. So, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, one of the arguments could be, boy, it sounds like you're going to be joining the WEF globalists to limit air travel and make all of us stay within 15 minutes of our house. I know that that conversation could be sparked by this, but would it be safe to say that one of the things we could do at least is is lower the planes so they're not so close to our stratosphere and releasing permanent particles, but keeping particles that fall to the earth? Is that a part of this conversation at all? Or am I just, you know, going in the wrong direction here? I mean, honestly, that's probably one of the better ideas. It, it the, the thing I said about 10 years ago was be careful what you wish for. Because while everybody's complaining about the clouds, the, the, the alternative could be worse. So when they banned bunker fuel in, in ships, they switched to biofuels, which something called VLSFO, very low sulfur fuel oil. They literally call this stuff Frankenstein fuel now. So though it does not produce as many marine stratocumulus clouds, chemtrails over the Pacific Ocean, the pollution it actually makes now is probably more poisonous, more dangerous. Right. So you may end up in a scenario where public outcry demands that they stop making clouds altogether and the antifreeze they have to stick come in, you know, in the exhaust pipe until they come up with the best Teslas of the sky um, is actually worse. You know, the, the solution's worse than the problem. Right. I don't know what, what they're going to do to solve this pollu this pollution problem. What I do know is that we need data and we need transparency and accountability. So that's the direction that I'm going with this. When they banned weather warfare in 1978, they did not make any way to catch somebody doing weather warfare. When they banned upper atmospheric nuclear explosions with the limited test ban treaty, they created the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization and the International Monitoring System. It is infrasound recorders and seismographs so that when Kim Jong-un, rocket man, fires off a nuclear bomb, they can triangulate and tell within like a five-mile radius when and where he violated the limited test ban treaty by blowing up a nuke. Mm -hmm. They never created a process to catch somebody doing rogue geoengineering, meaning illegal geoengineering, and they never created a process to catch somebody doing weather warfare. So my solution is called the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, which would require that an addendum to the United Nations ban on weather warfare um, include transparency. You must tell us before you modify any weather anywhere any in the world at any time in real time on a map so the public can see it and create a sensor network to detect chemicals in the atmosphere, chemicals in the rainfall patterns, chemicals that we can recognize as intentional weather modification chemicals. Simultaneously creating a citizen-powered network because just like after Fukushima, they turned off the EPA's RADnet, the Radiation Detection Network. What good is government sensors if they can just flip them off whenever they're up to no good? So, I want a citizen powered network of, you know, rain sample, all sky cameras. I call it the climate viewer for your backyard. I intend to do a, you know, a fundraising thing to, to actually build this machine, put it in your backyard, connect it to a real time monitoring website like climateviewer.org, my Climate Viewer 3D um, globe, and be able to show in real time what chemicals are falling where and when so that we can trust but verify. But that's not good enough because I don't know about you, I hate the United Nations. I'm like Dave Chappelle on the United Nations. <laughs> what are you gonna do, United Nations? Sanction me with your army. Oh wait, you don't have one. I guess you better shut the heck up. Right. Just like with what's going on in New Hampshire, I'm trying to draft a, make a draft legislation that explains to people all of the things that we briefly discussed here and come up with a language to where individual states can ban geoengineering and start the process of gathering data on, you know, what's in there. You think that's air you're breathing and what's in the rain coming down. 
because without that data, proving damages is not possible. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He came to my hometown and all I wanted to get out of RFK was, will you ban geoengineering? Because I, I understand, I don't care what your beliefs on climate change are. If you believe CO2, fine, fly a kite. Um, you know, don't drink, you know, soda with bubbles in it, fine. Um, I don't care, but hands off mother earth, hands off my sky, do not block sunlight. That will change rainfall patterns worldwide. That will kill people. The only thing stopping the legalization of geoengineering as a running program in the public is, as they put it, how to pay the dead people. Now, I don't like the idea that geoengineering governance will rest in the United Nations where the only thing holding it up is picking winners and losers and deciding who may never get rainfall again. This is the analog to volcanoes. When volcanic eruptions happen, rainfall patterns change worldwide. They know this. So if you start a geoengineering program, which we've had one going on for decades, we're only two or three very large volcanoes away from throwing that radiation budget off so badly that we have a modern ice age, a.k.a. Snowpiercer, the film. So, so let me, let me um, understand that. So you're saying now with the amount of particles we already have in the stratosphere, we're getting so dangerously, dangerously close that a couple of volcanoes could just do the job and suddenly now we are really have, struggling to get enough sun to the earth to, to we're, we're, in a, we're in some sort of solar winter then. Let me be blunt, and I don't like to do fear porn, but this is it. Global cooling is way more dangerous than global warming. Global warming, we can adapt, we can overcome. We are going into a solar minimum. The sun cycle is getting weaker and weaker. If you don't educate yourself, if you're, if you're part of the climate cult, fine. But I suggest you might want to go listen to somebody like Dr. Willie Soon or do some education, CO2coalition.org. You know, learn about mm -hmm. how the solar cycles have been left out of all these IPCC reports. Right. Learn about how the temperatures come from urban heat islands and not rural locations. How the data is skewed. It's very easy to skew data. So in the case of we're already headed into a solar minimum. They have these climate clocks now ticking all around the globe. Their countdown timer conveniently ends in 2029 just in time for Agenda 2030, which would coincide with the next solar minimum. So I've just been, if you want me to put my conspiracy hat on, I will. The global elites would like to geoengineer the planet just in time to take advantage of the global cooling that will already occur and declare themselves the savior of man from global warming because they know it's already going to cool. And all of this climate carbon scam, global boiling coming out of the Pope's mouth, all of that is about control. And if they, if you want to be controlled like a robot, if you want to go back to COVID-19 lockdowns, you haven't even heard about climate pandemics and the lockdowns that they want to do over yep. the climate. You're familiar with these, right? I am familiar. We've been talking about these things on the show. At Fred, I'll be honest. We have an international body of scientists and investigators that we meet with, and we talk about these issues. And a few of them have been saying during COVID, this is the beginning. They are going to start trying to do this with the global warming issue. I'll be honest. At first, I was like, no way. And now we are definitely hearing that language. We're hearing it out of Davos. We're hearing it out of the WEF. So I agree with all of that. And so, so they're playing this game. You know, they're trying to control us. They know that they, they they've watched the cycles. They know when this clock ends. They're going to try and claim a victory. But they could. They're putting us dangerously close to actually really blocking too much sun at a point where it's not as strong and we really need it. And then we have a real problem on our hands. Is that what, is that that's essentially correct. what you're saying? All right. That, that is very correct. So that that's the part of this that, that, that gets my goat. Even Alan Robach, 
he's a geoengineer. He went to a meeting on geoengineering and this is probably the most priceless quote I've ever heard out of a geoengineer's mouth. He, he went into the room and it was like almost a hundred degrees in the room. And they're all sitting there talking about controlling the temperature of the planet. And he thought to himself, we're talking about controlling the temperature of the planet, <laughs> but we can't control the temperature of the room we're in right now. <laughs> I mean, the hubris of these yeah. individuals, the fact that cloud seeding, was invented in 1946 by Benson Shaver, Irving Langmuir, and Bernard Vonnegut. And since 1946, they have not been able to prove to the National Academy of Sciences or any other body that cloud seeding has scientific efficacy, meaning it is repeatable, um, provable. You know, you can say in advance what's going to happen. There's too much chaos in the climate. There's too much chaos in weather. It's completely unpredictable. So how could you possibly predict what's going to happen if you loft 10 million tons of sulfur, aluminum, titanium, diamond dust, or calcium carbonate? David Key's Scopex program at the Harvard Solar Geoengineering um, program, they specifically moved on to what's called calcium carbonate because they say, oh, it'll take care. It won't take you know destroy the ozone layer, but it'll cool the planet. The problem is even David Keith admits, well, you know, if we put a million tons of sulfur into the atmosphere, like I'm, you know, estimating that we should do, I admit that will kill many tens of thousands of people. But it is our hope that we would save more lives than we would take because global warming. This is a really important moral point. So if I made a decision or if there was a collective decision to do a geoengineering program and you put, say, uh, the kind of program I think makes more sense to put about a million tons a year in, but let's say, you might end up killing many tens of thousands of people a year as a direct result of that decision. I think that has moral consequences. I don't sweep under the rugs. So this is a case where I take this much differently from Alan and think it's a much more serious issue. Now, it's true that as part of doing that, you would hope that the overall benefits of human mortality would be so that you would save many, many more people than that. This eerily reminds me of Robert Oppenheimer. And most people have heard the I am become death part of that interview. We knew the world would not be the same Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. What they didn't hear was the full interview. At the beginning of the interview, Oppenheimer says, they hoped, or other people hoped, that it would put an end to this war, save countless lives, and that on the whole we were inclined to think that if it was needed to put an end to the war and had a chance of so doing, we thought that was the right thing to do. Well, you know, it was our belief as scientists that if we created this weapon, that many more lives would be saved than taken. Right. I mean, look, we, we see this, and I, I just, you know, there's so much stupidity in science right now. We're talking, you know, atomized vaccines, highly infectious vaccines, that everybody, basically man-made disease, will start sweeping the planet because they know better. Now we're talking about, you know, man-made weather affecting, you know, the clouds. All of this you know, really is scary. There's so little science and there's no real respect for chaos theory or the fact that you have no idea how damaging the, you know, and the long-term effects of what are happening here. So in the end, 
just to sum this up for those that really are, you know, have been caught up in this chemtrail experience and watch this show. And I've promised them we are going to investigate this to the edge of whatever we can find, what we can prove. This idea when someone says to me, I just want to get rid of the lines in the sky, that that could be done by just changing, you know, where the planes are flying. And in some ways, it may stop the clouds that reflect the sun during the day or trap the heat during the night. But in the end, whether you're seeing the cloud or not, the same amount of chemicals that are coming from this exhaust is falling yes. to the earth and you are breathing it. And it is most definitely affecting your health. At the end of the day, this is this is the point that's lost on almost everybody. That yes, the the buildup of nanoparticles in the atmosphere go through chemical process changes as they fall to the earth. What goes up must come down, and it will come down eventually. What's been in the stratosphere will be coming down for the next two to four years minimum. We haven't even you know breached less than a percent of what we could talk about as problems related to this. It was SpaceX, sound, you know, sounding rockets, all of the other things that are lofting chemicals into the, ap into the high atmosphere. So it's going to be raining down on us forever, whether you see a cloud or not. That is a big problem that nobody's willing to talk about. Instead, they want to focus on, um, you know, more gallons and nanobots and, okay, yeah, nanobots, been talked about might be possible. Morgellons, okay, might be possible. Why don't we focus on the big picture that we can prove and try to put a dent in this airline industry, which has been unregulated forever yeah. and is poisoning the entire planet. That's uh, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be pragmatic. It makes perfect sense to me. I've done the same thing with vaccines, the same thing with vaccines. There's nanobox, graphene oxide, all these things. I've put these things under microscopes, electron spectrometry. And what I'm saying is it's not that there's not research on nanobots that could be injected to you and control your mind. But so far, I haven't seen them. And there's enough problems with this product that is killing people worldwide that I think we can actually get in and stop them and do something about it. I don't need to go that far into my imagination, into things I cannot right. prove to actually make a difference here. That's why I think what you've said today is really fascinating I, I the the journey you've taken me on you know at first I thought oh he doesn't believe there's any you know you know um, geoengineering going on you're just using a different delivery system that's a fuel-based delivery system versus sprayers that are releasing it and now we see it's if it's a natural occurring they can move them they can change the fuel all of these things are taking place it makes a lot of sense to me um, and and you're absolutely right. What we need are regulatory agencies in this country and around the world, but certainly we live in the United States of America, that stop hiring, you know, the professionals from the industry to run their, you know, to, to, to run the oversight on this. That are always going to be the benefit of the airline versus the benefit of the humanity. Same thing we do with vaccines. I'm really tired of pharmaceutical products being tested by the industries that are going to make, you know, hundreds of That's billions right. of dollars from them. I want, you know, I want professional experts that are, you know, blocked from this revolving door to go in a regulatory agency and out to go make, you know, millions of dollars for themselves like we saw Scott Gottlieb do and these people do into the FDA, out to, you know, Exxon, into CDC, out to Pfizer, all of these things and the same thing it's, with it's, FAA, it's, all of it. It's it, the same it, problem. It's the same revolving door. Um, from representative to lobbyist to representative to lobbyist. Um, with the airline industry, you got to think about it this way. All those boys flying to Davos certainly don't want their private jets taken away. And if you look at ADSB Exchange on any given day, they're color coded by altitude. And you know who's flying at 45,000 feet every single time? It's the private jets. Mm. Ex almost exclusively in the stratosphere. So private jets, you know, the, the, the these same guys that are going to preach to you, they're directly flying in the, the stratosphere no matter where they are in the globe. So they really don't care. Is the answer, um, just because we, you know, I want to sort of wrap this up. Are you saying we have to stop flying as much? 
or is there something we could do to actually have less chemicals in the sky and less particles gathering in the stratosphere? This, this is the heartbreaking part for me because I've read all their internal documents. I've read their outward, you know, propaganda and they readily admit that, you know, getting, it's kind of like Tesla, you know, even Elon Musk admits that it's going to be, you know, several decades before we can transition to an all electric grid, you know, to power all electric cars. And the same is true with the airline industry. They're trying to transition, but good luck. You know what I mean? When you've got planes that are literally 30, 40, 50 years old, still flying people around today, you can only imagine how much red tape they're going to have to go through to get to a place where we actually have batteries that are light enough that can hold enough energy and produce enough thrust and people trust it, then have zero emission planes that aren't making clouds. And even then, you know, you got aerodynamic contrails, which is another subject. I, I don't see a very good solution for any of them. Um, the, the, the pollutants are going to be there. What I do see as a problem is them taking you know, taking away sunlight because not only does it affect our ability to see the stars, not only is it driving people crazy online, it's affecting vitamin D absorption. It's affecting the solar energy sector. Yep. Isn't it ironic that the oil producers that make the jet fuel are making the clouds that are making you less money on your solar panels? Mm. I mean, that's a whole story in and of itself that we won't get into. Um, but right now, these same climate cultists that want to say we're all about saving the Arctic, they are literally in a race for melting the Arctic to get to the oil and gas under the Arctic. It's called the new cold war. So everybody's talking out of both sides of their mouth. What all I, all I want to do is get transparency on this. And when I spoke to Dr. Rangasai Althori, I said it simply. When I point at the cloud and I say chemtrail, and you point at the same cloud and you say contrail, we are both right. And that doctor laughed out loud and he said, I see your point. Mm. Why can't the average public understand that semantics is what's destroying the ability to have an honest conversation about what's going on or do anything about it? And we saw this at the New Hampshire um, geoengineering ban attempt this month. And when they went back for round two with different armed with different terminology, it seems like they're getting a good outcome. And they're maybe actually going to pass a geoengineering ban in, in New Hampshire. But at the end of the day, without verification, without the ability to collect these chemicals and prove yep. beyond a shadow of a doubt what's landing in your backyard and what you're breathing, we will never, ever be able to prove damages, take action against these people. So that's where, you know, my solutions are based in gathering more data, just like you did, Del. Um, you know, yep. go with the facts, go with what you can prove and worry about the nanobots and the Morgellons and all the other crazy things later because otherwise you may be just you know betting on a horse that's never even going to make it on the track those are all really great points i think we're aligned in the approach to making the world a better place transparency we got to demand that our regulatory agencies actually do studies and hand us the information the same thing you can't keep avoiding doing for instance, a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study, and then tell us that all the autoimmune disease is not caused by the vaccines. There's no way that you can say that. There is science and studies that could be done that can get us to these answers. And you're right, I can't prove it. It's all anecdotal, but I know how we could prove it. And when you're avoiding doing those studies, I think there's a reason why. And so every state that's going to attempt to pass laws that maybe, you know, put the humanity back in the driver's seat. It's been a real education today. I want to thank you for your incredible body of work. Uh, where do we follow? If we want to follow all that you're doing, what's the best place to check out the stuff that, that, that you're doing? Um, you can go to climateviewer.com. Add Climate Viewer on YouTube, Rumble, Bit, Shoot, Odyssey, Twitter, Facebook, all the usual places. But yeah, climateviewer.com 
has links to all my social media and stuff like that. And then climateviewer.org is my separate website where I do mapping and real-time data acquisition from all the government sensors, satellites, and all that sort of stuff. At the end of the day, like I, I want people to take away from this that today we only spoke about chemtrails and, geo, and a little bit of geoengineering. We didn't discuss anything about weather warfare, um, laser lightning rods, ionospheric heaters, the, the myriad of other programs going on. People only focus on clouds. So of all the things that I've ever talked about in 20 years now, I've never gotten an argument or pushback on any of them because everything I've said has been peer reviewed and, and quoted by scientists. But on this single issue, chemtrails, it has been the most taxing, painful experience of my life because people have such strongly held beliefs. As Carl Sagan famously said, it is simply too painful to admit to yourself that you've been had. And that's where a lot of people are. They don't want to admit that they could have possibly fallen for, you know, been taken for a fool. I was. I was one of you. 20, 15 years ago, and it took me understanding language, perception management, and mind control through high-level descriptors to pull myself out of that funk and dig deeply into this topic. As a, probably you have, Dell, you have to be able to look at stuff minus your ego and understanding the terminology in front of you. So I'm flipping between peer-reviewed journal science to you know, go get a definition and then back. And now, oh, now I understand what graphene laminate means. Laminate, like laminated, it's a, you know, coating around the black soot. Okay, let's move on. So there is graphene coming out of the back of planes. It's in the jet fuel and they're admitting to it in a peer reviewed journal entry, 75% um, of man-made metals in these cirrus clouds. So there you can literally just pile it on the desk of a representative and go argue with all of these people because they're saying it openly. Yeah. All we're saying is do something about it. Well, I'm glad you're out there. I'm glad you're attempting to do something about it. That's what it means in this world, taking action. We've got to take action. So thank you for your time today, Jim. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. I appreciate you having me on, Dell. I'm a big fan, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this very little-known topic. All right. And I hope that this resonates with you. It does. We'll do it again soon. Take care. Well, you know, I, I'm curious. I'm going to go back and watch the comments on today's show. I wonder how many of our followers bailed out thinking, oh, my God, he's going to say climate change isn't real next or something or that, that the chemtrails aren't real. Uh, and honestly, when I was being pitched this story, I mean, this is one of those moments where I thought I understood it. I thought I understood where Jim was going to be coming from. And I thought, well, maybe to let us off the hook a little bit. I mean, if there's not sprayers putting that in the sky, you know, we can maybe relax a little bit. And I don't know how many of you are sitting there and maybe it's got to sink in. But this is even more terrifying than anything that I could have imagined. It's worse. It's worse if they're actually just deciding, you know, is our government deciding to put the airplanes at certain levels so that it's trapping heat and causing all sorts of problems. And meanwhile, that jet fuel does have toxic chemicals that are dropping on us and changing our environment, changing our world. I mean, all of this is really quite disturbing. Um, so I, I don't know about you. I had a that's a really wild ride I just had there in that interview because it did not go where I was expecting it to go. And it just shows you sort of preconceived ideas. Right. How many of you just thought, oh, I know where this is going. And then you're like, whoa, holy cow. Very well thought out uh, ideas there. And, and look, as I've said on the high wire, uh, you have to take this information in. And if you're questioning all that you just saw, then you better be on our newsletter. You better be able to download all the information we were just talking about, all of the documents that were discussed so that you can read it yourself and say, hold on a second. I'm not sure I trust that guy, Dell. Good. Good. That's what you're supposed to be. That's what I am. That's what I do. I'm skeptical, man. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about anything. And so I need evidence. I need science. I need to know where it started, where it ended, who funded it. 
You know, and you start getting these little red flags in there. And some of these conversations about, you know, planes with sprayers and, you know, the hundreds of thousands of these airplanes that they would have to take to do that across the country has not been lining up with my Occam's razor perspective, which is the simplest answer must be true. I feel like some of this feels so much more complicated than it would need to be. No doubt they're manipulating our weather. They admit to it. But how are they doing it? What if they're just using regular passenger planes? These are all things that I don't think you're going to find anywhere else. And you can decide whether you agree with it or not. We're not here to tell you what to think. We're trying to show you how to think, how you do your own investigation like Jim clearly has been doing on his own. In the end, I hope it sparked your thoughts. I hope it makes you think twice. It also gets you to start thinking, maybe I need to get involved with my government. I got to look at what they're working on. Are they being transparent about everything that's going on here? That's what the high wire is all about. We're going to keep finding interesting stories that interest us and dig deeper into places no one else has gone on a topic. We're not just going to say yes, because every other conspiracy says this is the way it works. That's not how we work. We actually believe in science. We believe in investigations. And as I've said before, a lot of times, like chemtrails, I will still say, I don't think we've locked in on the exact answer. But instead of waiting till we do to bring the exact right person to manipulate you so that you agree with us, I'd rather interview people that are out there that have differing perspectives so that you can see how they answer. Are they right? Are they wrong? Do I trust them? Did that make sense? That's what this is. It's a live investigation happening right before your eyes. And we love that you're a part of it. And I hope to see you continuing on this journey with us next week on The High Wire. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from y'all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. Yeah! Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.